Hey, everyone. Uh, welcome. I'm excited you're with us today. So what I'm doing is I'm kicking off a series of interviews with business owners who are using EOS, and these people have insights, knowledge, or services that they want to share with other entrepreneurs. In case you're not familiar, EOS stands for Entrepreneurial Operating System. And what it is, it's a proven process with some simple tools to help small and mid-sized businesses become better at running their businesses and to produce powerful results. I'm Michael Deutsch. I'm a certified EOS implementer with EOS Worldwide. Today's guest is Rob Levin. Rob is the co-founder and chairman of Work Better Now. And Work Better Now helps companies bring on pre-vetted skilled talent so that they can be more productive and profitable. Rob, welcome. Thanks, Michael. Good to uh, good to see you, and thanks for having me. It's absolutely my pleasure. So Rob has a fascinating backstory that I'd like to hear about, um, and I'd also like to hear about how this all transitioned into you starting Work Better Now with your partner, Andrew. Um, so give me the two-minute version of your story. How'd you get here? Two minutes. Okay. So I... Um, three minutes. I'll give you three minutes. Okay. Started my career as a CPA with one of the big firms right out of college, and... Um, I'll just give you the, the fast version here. I worked for some smaller businesses uh, after that experience uh, as a CFO, COO, CEO. And then after the last, uh, the last job I had, I realized I didn't, never wanted to work for anybody again. So in 2003, I started a media company called the New York Enterprise Report. And I reflected back on, on my experience of running these smaller businesses and back, remember, 2003, the internet was not what it, what, it, what it is today. What I wanted to do was create a, a media company for business owners in the tri-state area, magazine, events, web, of course. And I wanted to bring top experts on, uh, on who can help these business owners run their business better through articles and, and speaking at events and stuff like that. Amazing experience. I uh, had that for 10 years before I sold it. Um, uh, and then I had a few different ventures. And then... Um, fast forward, let's, well, in, in 2013, I hired my first assistant and I wish I would have done it 10 years ago. Uh, and my assistant, um, my second assistant, first one didn't work out. Second assistant was from, uh, El Salvador. And, uh, over the years, a lot of, I knew a lot of business owners because of the media company. And over the years, I would refer people to this company in El Salvador who wanted their own assistant, um, because they were so impressed with Jessica, who was my assistant at the time. And at some point I said, you know what? I can do a better job at this. And mm -hmm. I'm in a bar with Andrew Cohen, my partner, who I've known since college. And we're, I said, I'm going to start this thing. And, and he goes, all right, I'm in. Long story short, we start this company. Um, my, who, my Jessica, who used to be my assistant, is now the general manager of the company. We've pivoted a few times. We can talk about that a little bit. And we've just had unbelievable growth. And uh, it's just really cool because a lot of, our friends, our clients, and the difference we're making in our clients' lives and our talent li our talents' lives. Um, it's just been one of the best experiences, certainly maybe the best experience I've had professionally in my entire life. Wow, that's fascinating, actually. The best experience that you've had. Um, what do you attribute that to? You know, um, so many different things. Um, number one, for me, having a partner with different skill sets has been amazing. I'm able to focus, you know, EOS speak, I can focus on being the visionary for the most part. And, and he's the integrator and that's working out very well. Um, that, so that's one thing. Number two, uh, we've, we've had this unbelievable growth. We'll, we'll, we should be making the Inc 500 next year in our first year of eligibility. Um, and uh, the, the feedback that we're getting from the clients that we help because we're providing talent to them, as well as from the talent that we're providing about the impact that we're making, both on the on those companies and on the talent, the, the people that work for the, the clients on their lives, it's just overwhelming. So, um, and, and, I, and then the last thing I'm gonna share is, you know, we have these core values, we have six core values. And this is the first company where we have some core values and we're actually living them. And that's a very cool experience. You know, when you combine that with the growth and, you know, having a business with one of my best friends, it's, it's just been an amazing experience. Can you share those core values? Do you know them? I'm going to put you on the spot. I can. I do have, I do, I'm going to cheat a little bit. <laughs> uh, so number one, we put our talent first. Um, we work with integrity and transparency. We have a growth mindset. That's not just my partner and I, but the entire company. We work with an ownership mentality. Ownership mentality is something I've been speaking about for years. And we, we've tapped into this workforce that has it. Work with an excellent attitude and then pursue excellence. 
those are our six core values up on our website. Now, you know, I'm, I'm um, as your EOS implementer, for those that don't know, I'm your EOS implementer. Um, I take pride in those core values for you. Uh, I've been out speaking with other EOS implementers or, you know, my marketing person who wants, an, uh, you know, a virtual assistant to help her coordinate her, her schedule, her time and working with you now. And I'm, I always feel proud to introduce you to my network because I know that you truly live those core values. One of the things about being an EOS implementer is we get to see it from the top down. So we know whether you're truly buying into it and living it and believing it. And that's why I always feel comfortable talking about you out there because I know you do, right? So I, I'm proud of the work that you did to be able to put your core values in place and to really push them through your organization. Yeah, thank, thank you for that. And, and having the team buy-in and living those core values is just an amazing thing to, to see. Yeah, I, I think uh, in general, people don't understand the power of the behaviors of a core value or a set of core values within the organization and how that reflects in productivity and profitability. Because I think it's been so ingrained in us that core values are nice language to have, but they haven't actually learned to live it as a behavior. And once they can do that, it actually does produce and it drives profitability in organization. And it's a, ch a separate conversation that we can have for, for perhaps for another time, because really what I want to do is I want to pivot back into talking more about, you know, work better now, how you do what you do. Um, and the fact that I often rely on you as a resource to understand the talent market and what's going on in general out in the talent market. You know, you and I were speaking recently, you gave me some statistics. I think you said, uh, you know, there's 9 million job openings out there and only 6 million people to fill those openings. Um, I was reading recently the inflation rate is at 3.7. It's been at 3.7 the last couple of months. It was down at 3 in June. And that was down from 9.1 the previous June, but still higher than, you know, let's say the 2% that we really should be trending towards. Now, all this stuff is great, right? I'm throwing a lot of numbers at you. You and I can talk about this stuff all the time. Um but what does this actually mean for the people on the ground? You know, it's nice to take these high level macro concepts. How do you actually see these concepts playing out for, let's say, an owner who's uh, got a hundred a hundred person workforce workforce behind them? How do you see it? And, you know, what three things might you see in this playing out for that actual owner? Well, first, let's let's go back to the data. And what I realized, I realized about a year ago and then. It's not like I heard people talking about a talent crisis, which is what I realized. But because um, if you ask a business owner, are, is there a talent crisis for your business? They may not say yes. But when you ask them some questions about the workforce and how it's impacting their, their companies, they will totally say, oh, yeah, 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 I'm with you. There's a talent crisis. So you mentioned, you know, there's more people, there's less people looking for, for jobs than there are jobs being posted. There's still an imbalance. And, you know, if you read the Wall Street Journal all year, you wouldn't know this because the Wall Street Journal has been talking about all the layoffs from big companies, right? Um, so that's one piece of data. The, it takes now six to seven weeks to hire somebody. That is really painful for a smaller mid-sized business because it usually took you two months to, fit, to really come to the conclusion you're ready to hire somebody, get that job posting up. And we know that hiring people is probably one of the least favorite things that business owners and their management teams like to do. Um, and then you have, you know, I'm not going to get into inflation so much, but you have increasing salary expectations, not so much, by the way, driven by inflation, really driven by the imbalance that we had right after the, pa the pandemic or at the end of the pandemic, the imbalance in terms of supply and demand of the workforce. Um, and then you have, at the end of the day, we have to talk about this. We have a productivity issue in this country. We have a third yeah. of the younger generation uh, workforce that, it, that comes out and says that I'm going to do the minimum at my job. Not, not just doing the minimum, but actually saying it. When you put all of that together and you ask most business owners, I would say eight out of 10, and they're gonna, you're going to hear things like, I have a productivity problem. It's impacting my growth. It's impacting my customer experience, right? I'm not getting back to customers as quickly. Um, it's, uh, it's creating stress on the existing workforce. My A players are leaving because I'm, I have C players on the team. These are the types yeah. of things that you're hearing. And that, that's a, you know, whether you can't operate 
where you should be or whether you can't grow, either one of those is a pretty major problem that the owner is going to take pretty personally. Uh, you know, I was just speaking with an owner actually just today. Um, he's definitely got a bit of a staffing issue, um, needs more help for sure. He's got someone who's sitting in his operations leadership seat and they're having and they're struggling. Um, they're struggling underneath them partially because they don't have enough staff and they're rushing orders. So they're making mistakes on their orders. And in fact, he may actually lose a very big, well-known client because of the mistakes. Problem also is he doesn't have anyone on the sales side strong enough to be able to run business development. So he's got his hands in a little bit of everything. And a lot of this is a result of not having the right people and not having enough people. And those are two common themes that I typically hear. And I was just having this conversation today. And I made him sit down and say, okay, so which one of these are you going to solve today? Because you've got to get yourself out of the weeds because you've got to start closing business and you've got to start delivering properly so you don't lose clients out the back end. That's right. And that's a big challenge that I see with my with with people when they come to me initially. You know, as I mentioned before, you know, 90, 90 to 95 percent of the people I can boil down their issues to people or process. And in many cases, it's oh. both because they're really strongly intertwined. Yeah. Right. So I can always tie it back into either one of those. Yeah. Yeah. It's it's a it's a real problem. You know, we I don't think we I, I don't think I explained what we do. What we do at Work Better Now is we provide talent from Latin America for about 40 different roles for U.S. based small and mid-sized businesses. Um, and uh you know, I think there's a few things that companies can be doing. Number one is expand your talent, right? So look remote. Certainly, if you're in a place like New York City, looking remote is going to provide you with a lot more talent and probably at a lower cost. Um, consider overseas, which is where companies like, like, like we come in. But there's some other things you could do, too. I think, number one, you know, you talked about customers going out the back door while you're bringing in new customers in the front door. You got to do the same with talent. So you have to really look at retaining your talent and attracting talent. And actually you can, there are several things you can do that will help both of those things. I'm happy to elaborate if you, if, if, if you want to, if you want me to. Yeah. I mean, I would love to hear it. You know, I actually, the question that I wanted to ask you was, as you were going through this, if you could pick three things for a company to do when considering bringing on remote talent, what would those things be to ensure success? Because you and I both know that a bad hire is very, very costly. So what could they be doing when they're looking on looking to bring on remote talent to make sure that it can be a success? Okay, there's a bunch of things. But before we even go there, I just want to be clear. The first thing you should be doing is looking to retain your top talent. Okay, we can talk more about that or we can leave that for another time. Uh, another, well, I'll leave the other thing off the table because I have a feeling you're going to ask me about AI later. I'm sure you will because you and I talk <laughs> about AI all the time. So in terms, do. Of, in terms of working with remote talent, um, the first thing you have to realize, and a lot of people don't realize this, is that you have to remember that your culture with your remote workforce will never be better than the culture that you have in the office. Said another way, if you don't have a good culture in the office, you're going to have some really big challenges on remote. So you got to fix that, the, the culture in the office, or maybe it's pretty good. Try to make it better. And there's a number of things you can you can do for that. Um, number one, um, it, it, this is in no particular order, but uh, recognize people, recognize people. It's really not hard to put in formal recognition programs. They're not expensive. We just wrote a blog that's up on our website, workbetternow.com, uh, talking about the program that we implemented, uh, I think about a year ago, maybe a little bit more, called the W Awards. It's very easy. It's very inexpensive. And the look on people's faces when they get recognized, you know, we're a 100% remote company, and so we got a, we have a month, uh, sorry, a weekly, a weekly meeting with everybody. And the look on people's faces when they get recognized is so priceless. So recognize people, show them that they're, that they're appreciated is one of the things you can do to make a remote environment, uh, to, to make a remote environment work. I run into this a lot uh, when I'm speaking with clients, because this kind of goes back to what we were talking about before, about how do you... How do you activate core values within an organization? I often think about these types of recognition programs through the lens of how do I recognize people for core value wins in an organization? And some of the, the questions that I get asked is how hard is it to implement this? How hard is it to implement it and gain traction? Maybe you could speak a little bit about what your experience was like in trying to implement this recognition program and some of the pitfalls perhaps that 
uh, you can help others to avoid. I'm not even sure if I have pitfalls. I'll just start with what, what, what I'll just tell you what we did. It was really easy. So we call them the W awards, right? Work better now. And anybody in the company can nominate anybody else. And it's for something incredible they did. And when you are nominating them, you have to talk about at least one of the core values that were upheld. Um, they write that up. We have a form for them to fill for them to fill out. Um, it then goes to my partner, the CEO, to Andrew. He reviews it. He determines whether or not he wants to, he thinks it's worthy of an award. And, um, you know, once a week we announce if, if there's anybody who won the award, we announce the winner. They get a certificate. Of course, it's digital because we're, you know, a remote company. Um, and uh, and they get a little something put in their uh, their next paycheck. It's that it's that simple. It's that simple. It doesn't have to be all that. It doesn't have to be that complicated. The part that I love about that is the the fact that the team is nominating each other. Right. So the, you socialized it and normalized it through the organization so that they're actually using your your core values as part of their day to day language. And that's really the key to getting that great uh, culture, core, core value built out, you know, tying it back to how can you know, what are some of the things that we have to do to ensure that a remote workforce is successful is having that strong culture from within the organization, not just from the top down in a way from the bottom up and, and you know, laterally as well. So recognition is one one way to make a remote workforce work. Another is to have, um, you know, you got to remember there's no water cooler, right? People aren't running right. into each other on the way to the bathroom or the kitchen or whatever. So having scheduled meetings is really important. And that's either, a, that could be a company-wide meeting, or it's usually all of these things. Company-wide meeting, departmental meeting, um, obviously running these things through L, you know, in an L10 framework. I think goes a long way. It's been extremely helpful for us. And then one-to-one -one meetings because you're not, you can't rely on somebody knowing what's going on, be, you know, because again, they overheard something in the kitchen. Um, it's important to do those, have those scheduled. The other thing it's important to do when you have remote workforce is be really clear on what the rules are, right? So when you have, when you have people working remotely, yeah, they're probably really enjoying that because maybe they don't have the commute Etc. But there's probably other reasons. Let's be realistic. There's other reasons, right? They might want to take the kids to school. Maybe they want to go to the gym. Whatever the rules are, I'm not telling you what what they should be, but just be really clear on what they are, um, what that looks like. How do you also? How do you communicate as a company? Is it through chat? Is it through email? When do you pick up the the video phone and and have and have a chat? Be clear about not only the tools you use, but when you should use them. So, for example. You know, one of the things that would drive me crazy is if every time somebody had a question, they hit me on chat, right? Ding, ding, ding. N none of us need that, right? So, you know, what are what are okay. some of the, the 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 rules around that? You know, between that and focusing on a culture, on 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 having a strong culture, that's going to help have a thriving remote environment. Actually, I want to mention two more things that just popped into my head. Number one, be very clear about for each role what success looks like. Right. Number yep. one, that doesn't mean to tell people how to do everything. It means to tell them what success looks like. You're hiring them because you're you're hoping that they are going to figure out a how and hopefully figure out how to do it better than you do. But if you are clear on what success looks like, you're taking a lot of the mystery, uh, a, a lot of the mystery. Yeah. Out. And before I let you get to your your additional point, that's not just for remote workforce. That is in general for any person at any level in an organization. And one of the reasons why people fail, new hires fail. And by the way, there's a statistic out there that says six, about 60% of managers fail within the first year, which is a tremendous number. Part of that is because we're not setting them up for success by telling them what success looks like. We're not explaining the pitfalls of the position and what they need to accomplish and giving them what the win looks like. We're bringing them in and hoping that they succeed. And that's not a recipe for, for success. Yeah, I forgot the second one. So I'll just double down on this one. And I will tell you, <laughs> I'll tell you from personal experience, um, somebody once called me a drive-by delegator. It took me a while to figure it out. And then I figured it out. I just thought, because I'm, I'm a visionary type of person, I'm always going to have new ideas. Number one, I was throwing way too many ideas out on people's laps, right? Yeah. Using them. 
And then I wasn't specific about what I meant. Again, not not the how, but ex- what? What is the end result supposed to be? Um, so that in a, in a remote environment, that actually becomes a lot more dangerous if you don't do that. Um, yep. Strategic Coach, which I'm, I'm, I know you're familiar with, great yes. program out of Toronto. They have a great tool called the Impact Filter. Uh, you could probably Google it. And, and it really it ensures that you've thought through an idea and articulating again, what does the end result look like? It's been very helpful for me. Yeah, and it's a great tool. I've used it in my own practice. Uh, so it's definitely beneficial. People should definitely check that out. Go Google it. Um, you know, I'm going to go into something that you had said before. You knew it was coming. We talk a lot about AI. You and I have been talking about it for, I don't know, at least six months, maybe more. Um, and it's been basically one of the main topics of conversation in the business world for the last year or so since uh, OpenAI released ChatGPT 3.5, right? So how how is w, WBN looking at AI? How are you guys using AI? Where are things going with AI for you? So let's go back to our, our mission, right? Our mission is we want to expand the capabilities of our talent and of our clients, right? And so... When you think about AI, and we were also talking about the talent crisis, right? One of the issues with the talent crisis is you have a productivity issue. AI, and I'm going to put automation in there too, mm-hmm. uh, use them separately. Um, AI and automation can really help companies with the talent crisis, in, in addition to helping them in many, many, many other ways. But with AI, you can take a lot of tasks, same with automation, a lot of tasks that take a long time, and you can have AI do it doesn't cost you anything or doesn't cost you much um, for the right tasks. It's going to produce amazing results. So the way we are thinking about this is when, when chat GPT 3.5 came out, we really thought about this for a little bit. Um, and, you know, me with the visionary hat was thinking, um, you know what, I guarantee you people are going to start to ask, well, how is AI going to impact your business? Right. Yeah. And I, and I, I thought about it. I thought about it. I thought about it. And I remembered that, look, most small and mid-sized businesses usually don't, they're not the quickest, nor, nor should they be the first, but they're not the quickest when it comes to adopting uh, new technologies, right? So we are going to help them do that. What, what, we, what we decided we were going to do is we were going to AI enable our clients through our workforce. Now, the question, the next question is, is, well, how are we doing that? So the first thing we realized that we had to do is we had to start using AI ourselves. So earlier this year, at at our L10 meeting with our leadership team, um, I said to the team, hey guys, AI is gonna be a big part of our business. I want you to experiment. Take a few hours every week. Um, You know, if you need a few hundred dollars or a thousand dollars for budget to buy something, go ahead. And I want you to experiment. And I want you to document it. And amazing thing. First of all, you notice I was not the one who said, I'm going to figure out the AI stuff. Mm-hmm. Number yeah. one, um, I'm, like, I'm a who, not how kind of guy. At least I am these days. And number two, <laughs> I'm the older guy. The digital native pe- people who work for us, our, our, our leadership team, they're younger, they're digital natives. They're going, to do, they're going to do a much better job of figuring this out than I am. And they yeah. have. So the results have been amazing. We're already using AI throughout the organization. Uh, we're going to start blocking on our experiences soon. And we just, uh, just announced that we're launching the pilot of WBN Academy, which is a continuous education program for all of our remote professionals that work for our clients. And um, it's, it's going to be working on a tenure basis, so our more senior remote professionals get to participate soon. And they're going to learn a number of things. AI is only one of them, but it's a, it's a cornerstone. And the idea is that they will then AI enable, you know, our clients. And we're so excited about it. We got some amazing feedback from some clients. But the first step was we had to start using it ourselves, right? And we had to start experimenting yeah. with ourselves. And you can't break it, right? So you just go on there and you try. And we, we used it for certain types of content. You have to be careful which types of content you use it for. It's not really, you you can't expect AI to write a good blog for you. And I can talk about that a whole nother time, but uh, we're using to analyze data. We're using automation throughout the business, um, not only uh, on the CRM side, but on our operation side. And it's making huge impacts. We're getting rid of spreadsheets, um, which are are terrible for an organization. 
Um, but again, we, we started using it ourselves and now we're in a position to roll it out um, with our remote professionals. Very excited. You know what I love that you said? You, you, you used the term, you said that we are helping to AI enable our clients. And I love that because uh, for a few reasons, but it, it hit on a topic that I was speaking about actually again this morning with another, uh, with an EOS implementer, another EOS implementer, uh, because believe it or not, we actually know each other and we work well together with each other and we like each other. Um, but we were actually talking about just state of affairs of business and general markets and AI came up and we see uh, the trends and the changes in the work environment related to AI. And he made a very interesting point. He said, you know, the big companies are going to, going to um, very quickly figure out AI in their organization. And the fear is that the small and mid-sized companies are going to be too slow to respond and are going to get buried by the bigger organizations who have the time, the money, the resources to be able to dedicate into it. This was his, his you know, explanation on it. Yeah. And I thought there was some validity to it. So when a company like w, WBN can come in and help to, as you put it, AI enable their clients, you're helping them keep up, keep up with the big boys. And that's what I'd like to hear. That's that's the part that I was really fascinated with when you would just mention that and as you were talking about how WBN is using AI. Yeah, I don't know if if the big companies using AI are gonna, you know, quash the little companies using AI, or if it's gonna be other small and mid-sized businesses using AI are going to quash, you know, those small businesses that are not using AI. If you are not using AI, I think as Peter Diamantis said, if you're not, there's going to be two kinds of companies in 2030, right? Those either using AI or those that are out of business. And it's going to be a painful road yeah. for those companies that don't start using AI. They're going to just start seeing d- diminished revenues, diminished margins, working much harder. You, it's going to be a competitive disadvantage. I'm 100% sure about that. It, there's no question that's going to that's going to be the case. It's a transformative technology and it's and i agree it's not going to be hard for you to implement it in your company just start yeah yeah and i think a lot of people are fearful of it well fearful and they don't understand it and i think that lack of understanding gives them pause to go try it the way that you did they're not walking into a level 10 meeting hopefully they are their eos companies and they have level 10s but they're not walking into a meeting and empowering their team and putting them in charge of AI initiatives to figure out how we could use this to better our organization and better our clients. Right? And so I think those people are going to get left behind, but if we can come together and help them and bring them with us, I think there's huge benefit to that, to them, to us, to, to the, um, the, the job market in general. Yeah. So, you know, business owners out there, you don't have to be the AI expert. You have to, all you have to do is say, all right, I know that this is really powerful. And we're going to find a way to do it, and then enable your enable your team to do it. You have to hire. I don't, I don't know if you're going to if if companies if there's good AI consultants for small businesses out there yet. But you know, again, it's not about you figuring it out. It's about either somebody on your team or you bringing somebody on your team that can help figure out how this will help improve the customer experience, improve efficiencies in the company. There's so many different things you can do. Do you if you could make one recommendation on where they should start? What part of the business do you think that would be a good starting point for them? Yeah, I, I can't tell you the part. I, what I can tell you is some of the things that we've done, okay? Um, so we have to uh, write emails for clients, right? Just as part of communications or prospects. We might start by going to either chat GPT. I, I couldn't, by the way, I couldn't tell you what the team's using because it's up to them. We, I know we use right. something called Jasper. Um we can, you can go to any of these places and uh, just start, ha- just say, hey, I need an email to clients or to prospects that says this, and they're going to give you something. And you say, change the tone, make it a little bit more serious or a little less serious or a little. And, and by the way, some of the tools out there will actually learn your writing style. So they'll mimic it. Yeah. So that's one thing to do. Um, or I want to write a blog. Okay. And I want to, I want to write it kind of around this. Give me some subtopics. Don't let AI write the blog for you. That's, I, I won't go into that in detail now, but you can let AI give you the details. You can also That's let right. AI, look, let's be realistic. Most people today are not good writers. So maybe you have something written that needs to go yeah. out. AI can edit it for you, make it sound nice and polished, get rid of all the, all the errors. So that's some basic things. You can also have AI write up your policies and your processes and procedures. 
You can also have yes. AI analyze your data. You have to be a little bit careful how you upload data and what data to upload. But our, um, you know, our, you know, Denoir, our head of recruiting, um, he was, yeah. he, he took some of our, the data on our remote professionals, including those who are no longer with the company. He took out obviously any personal identifying information. And he basically said, AI, just, just analyze this. He put up a whole bunch of data and he got amazing information on our, on retention data based on country, based on tenure and role, things that would have taken days, if not months to figure out. He got this feedback in two minutes and it was actionable. He's like, all right, by the way, the fact that he didn't have to spend a month on it meant he could spend the time looking at the results of the analysis from AI and then thinking about, all right, now what do I need to do to, to leverage this? Really, really powerful. These are some very basic step, steps. Uh, on the automation side, most companies, well, some companies are using CRM now that has at least some basic automation, right? If, right. if somebody clicks on this email, do this. If they don't click on this email after three days, do this. You can use that CRM. I've been doing this for years. You can use those same CRM tools to run some of your operations. There's no reason you can't. It just takes a little bit of thought. So it's not just AI. It's automation. You check out things like Zapier, which will connect yeah. connect one piece of software systems, with your yep. CRM to your um, to QuickBooks or whatever accounting um, uh, or ERP software you're using. Connect your yep. software so that you don't need somebody to re-enter and make a mistake and take all of that time. There are so many things; they're easy to do. You just got to start experimenting and uh, and and be committed to accepting the change and now harnessing it. I mean, those are all amazing points and great places to start. Um, you know, one thing that I've done in, in the AI world for myself is um, I have a lot of ideas rummaging around in my head. So if I want to write an article, where do I start? I'll get a theme and I'll use AI to help me generate, or I should say, focus in my thoughts to give me a consistent theme that I can use. And then I end up writing based on that because otherwise I'll end up with like a 35 page blog that no one's ever right. going to read. Right. That's not helpful for anybody, and, but that really has helped save me a lot of time in the brainstorming portion of it. Yeah. And that's, that's what I was alluding to earlier. You just have to be a little yeah. careful using AI for marketing content, like say for blog writing, you can, yeah. you can use it for ideas. You can use it for editing. Don't use it for the meat and potatoes because if you want to use content and I'm a, I've been in the content business also for a long time. If you want to use content for marketing purposes, think about it this way. It needs to change the point of view of the reader or whoever's consuming mm -hmm. the content. And that is not going to likely come from AI because AI is what's, what's already out there. AI is not recreating the wheel, right? They're just taking what's out there. You are the expert, whether you have a plumbing firm or you have a consulting firm, right? E either way, you know what your clients are paying for, right? You know what, where the value is. That's what your content should be based on. But AI can help you in the beginning and help you at the end. Great. I don't think that it should remove the personal touch. I absolutely don't believe in that whatsoever. I think you you and your personality still needs to be involved in your writing, in your business. Um, and I agree with that 100%. So there are a lot of companies out there that are offering similar services to what you do. You know, so if, if a company a client is out there and they're in the market for a virtual assistant what things should they be looking for give me three things that they should be looking for to make sure that they're speaking with the right companies when looking for a virtual assistant okay so first first off just a bit so we're on the same page um when we started we were just providing virtual assistance for business owner we believe every business owner should have an assistant um, we now provide over 40 roles. I think it might be over 50 now from marketing coordinators mm -hmm. to project managers to uh, customer service reps and on and on and on. Some very unique ones too. And we do this all with talent from Latin America. Um, so if if you're thinking about, let's say, hiring overseas talent and you don't want to do it directly, which is a, which can be challenging, you want to use what we call a talent provider. There's a lot of companies like us. In fact, a lot of companies are starting to look exactly like us, uh, which is very, very flattering. And we're not the only company out there. And there, by the way, there's other companies that, that, that do a pretty, pretty good job. So I don't want to talk about what we do, but instead I'll give you questions that you can ask these talent providers. Um, and you should also follow up with references, uh, you know, with, from clients asking the same questions. 
here's some of them. Number one, how do they, what is the process they do, they use when, when people are applying to them, what's the process they use to screen those candidates based on skills? Same question goes for English. How are they assessing English? How are they assessing it, assessing it verbally? And how are they assessing, assessing their, their written English as well? Um, how many interviews do they do before they're putting those candidates in front of you? And what does that process look like? Um, and then how, there's plenty of them, but here's just maybe the last one for now. How are they actually matching the candidates that they're interviewing with the people that you need? Not only the skills, but the cultural fit, the personality fit, et cetera. So those are a few questions to ask companies like us, these talent providers that, um, that can help you uh, tap into the overseas uh, talent pool. I love that because that match, you know, again, goes back to a lot of the cultural impact that we had from before is they still have to match the culture of your organization. And you need to know that the partner that you're working with really has that in mind. They're really looking for the right fit for your organization because obviously that benefits everyone. They're not looking to just fill a slot, We're looking to fill a slot with the right person. That's yeah. the key. That's the key. And that's, that's so, what we, that's what we spent, you know, neither my partner or not, nor I had experience in, in, in anything related to talent in terms of providing that as a service or what, what one day we will call ourselves TAAS talent as a service. And because of that lack of experience, I think we approach things very differently, which is how do we make this not only easy for the client, but compelling for the client and very effective for the client, which is why as yeah. you know, we have clients with six, seven, eight, nine, ten. We're now, we now have one client with 13 of our professionals and, and really amazing. looking at us uh, as a talent partner. We just didn't, we didn't use traditional staffing models because uh, we just didn't know any better. We just said, what, if we were a client, how would we want this done? And I love that. That's the best way to approach everything. I always voice a customer, voice a client is what do they need? What do they want? You know, how can we help them? Not just how can we help ourselves? Helping them helps us too. Right. And so I always believed in that. And I think that's the, that's the best way of looking at it. So I love the fact that we came at it from that way. So last question. And I, and I really want to end on a, on a fun note. So here's my question to you. If you could sit down to dinner with any three people and have a business discussion with all of them, who would those people be and why? Uh, let's see here. Um, I, I'm going to go a little traditional here, a little traditional here. Um, I'm going to go Elon Musk. Um, I'd be a little nervous just because he's probably a really hard guy to follow in terms of, you know, He's probably thinking 20 times faster than he's speaking, but just the way he thinks differently, I want to get access to that. Going really traditional with Warren Buffett on just kind of taking a long view and sort of what I, when I think about Buffett and what I'd love to learn more about from him is just finding those right lever points and doing those same things over and over again when everybody else is going after the shiny, uh, the, the, the shiny object. And then the third one, yeah. It's going to probably be um, a successful sports coach. And um, who might that be? It might be like a Phil Jackson, okay? Uh, a little painful because I was a Knicks fan in the, in the 90s. Yep. Uh, you know, so <laughs> still. I remember uh, it. Yes, yeah, still have those beatings, but um, in, my, in my mind. But mm -hmm. I, wanted, I want to know what is the key in getting – not only the most out of people, but getting people to work together as a team, particularly when you have, in his case, a few superstars. So those are three that I'd probably, uh, probably invite. If you ask me tomorrow, I might have another three, but those are the three for yeah. today. What, what I find interesting about that is, one, I, I'd want to talk to Phil Jackson and find out how he got, by, how he got people to buy into his system, right? And, and it was yeah. a relatively newish system. His spin on it was new. So how did he get everybody to buy in? And frankly, I just want to see Buffett and Elon Musk going at it because that's got to be fascinating. The old versus the young and the traditional versus the progressive and, you know, just, you know, complete polar opposites. I think that would be a fascinating conversation. Yeah, I you can just, yeah. just listen and you'll, you, to those two going at it. And then Phil, that's right. Phil coming in from like a Zen point, it'll be really interesting. <laughs> that's right you come in from the zen point of view i get <laughs> i love it anyway rob thank you so much 
Um, you know, if, if people out there, if you don't know Rob, you should. So Rob, tell us a little bit about how they can get in touch with you or to find out more about Work Better Now if they're interested in remote professionals. Um, where do they go? Workbetternow.com. Uh, everything you need is on the site, including some, we have plenty of blogs about remote, you know, managing remote talent and, and all of that stuff. We'll, we'll have some AI related blogs soon. And uh, for me, you can just find me on LinkedIn, uh, Robert Levin, Work Better Now. I'll pop up. I'll see you. Perfect. There. Perfect. Thank you so much, Rob. I really appreciate your time. Thank you. Thanks for having me, Michael.